My opinion has always been that the battle between good and evil was fought within the individual human heart. All of us have the capacity for good. All of us have the capacity for evil. The same people have Captain. the capacity for doing that on different days. They're human beings, uh, and human, human beings are endlessly fascinating. Look at me, sure. Look at me, sure. I'm the captain now. The good guys are behaving like the bad guys. Hi everybody! Hello, Noga! Hi, Welcome to another Game of Thrones Season 8 video. And today, very excited about this video. Okay, so you're a therapist, you're doing your PhD in psychoanalysis and hermeneutics. You treat people. So now we want to go to the big villains of Game of Thrones and see if we can put ourselves in their shoes. Dan Weiss, D.B. Weiss and David Benioff. Well, Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet and Euron's forces. They certainly haven't forgotten about her. And the Golden Company has arrived in King's Landing, courtesy of the Greyjoy fleet. Let's see if we can put ourselves in their shoes. It's not going to be easy because I'm very upset with them. And I feel all kinds of negative feelings towards them, contempt, anger. Contempt. <laughs> so, we don't know them. No, we're not gonna analyze them personally, of course. We're not, it's uh, yeah. very pretentious. Mm -hmm. We're gonna psychoanalyze their personas. But we're not gonna say anything about uh, David Benioff's uh, father and the fact that, uh, you know, he was like this major. The head of Goldman Sachs. Yeah, and no, uh, we're, gonna we're, we're not going to say. You yeah, know, because it was probably be... demanding. Maybe, you know, he always felt like uh, all he had to do was get daddy to make a phone call and something will happen. And it's because, you know, yeah, we're not no, going to talk about no. those things because no. they're less interesting in that sense. But And we're not going to talk about the fact that they're Jewish because we feel uncomfortable with that. Please don't <laughs> put it in the video. They are not Jewish. <laughs> Excommunicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to understand how a story that started so well with those two at the helm ended up a joke. You want a good girl, but you need a bad pussy. So when they started with Game of Thrones, they were kind of struggling uh, writers. Weiss more so than Benny Hoff. They weren't really well known and weren't uh, super successful. They had academic backgrounds and also a strong uh, affinity to, like, gen like, to mainstream uh, pop culture. Yeah, even though, I mean, they did have their own original novels, but yes. yeah. And they started uh, with the Game of Thrones adaptation, the first season. Maybe the most faithful adaptation of any literary work into the screen. This is the best season <laughs> of the whole show. Right. Slowly but surely, they started changing things up. Some of the changes were good. But there's always this shadow. It's not their story. Mm -hmm. It's his story. He is the genius. Nobody ever thought that they were the geniuses behind, behind the, the masterminds behind the story. I guess that people like their story of like, pe you know, there were like a couple of uh, young, you know, fresh princes. <laughs> up and coming. Up and coming. And they got this big break from HBO, even though they had no experience uh, prior hand. And, right. uh, you know, they had uh, yeah. this kind of like flop at the pilot. Then you go to HBO, you make a pilot, which didn't, they did not run. They, no. Why which, did they not? Because they, they wanted people to watch the second episode. I see. So, it didn't come out it, good? So we had messed up the, the most kind of obvious storytelling possibilities. And uh, HBO, for some reason, decided to give us another chance. You must really be good in a meeting. The HBO felt like it, they were an investment that did pay off. And I feel like at first they were like underdogs, like unassuming. They were taking mm -hmm. someone else's story, mm -hmm. not inserting themselves, their ego, their aspirations into the story. And I felt that would be the, that's something that should be commented. Commended. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it's very impressive. Yeah. That you take very impressive. someone else's work and you just say, "This is, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna make this 
the best it can be in this medium and not try to force myself mm -hmm. into it. By doing that, they showed a sense of uh, like humility, you know, I mean, you take someone else's work and uh, you give it a platform. So what happens to people that get this kind of tremendous break and, uh, you know... That they feel a little bit undeserving. Exactly. It could create what, you know, what is known as the imposter syndrome. Okay. The, the feeling that uh, people praise you, but basically you're not as good as people think you are. Mm. And that at one point they're going to find out who you truly are which is nothing like what they thought you were. Someone else could do, adapt this story. It's not you, it's this great story. Yeah, exactly. Just having a certain sympathy for George's uh, uh, role as the creator and, and how hard it is to let go of your, you know, you create all these little babies and now we've kind of grabbed them and run away with them and, and uh, are doing terrible things to them. Spit it out, you wee shit. Spit it out. So, uh, okay, so it's like annoying inner voice that tells you that you are nothing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what can that voice cause you in the long run if you listen to it? It could lead to, to this kind of uh, attempt to show autonomy, to show uh, uh, like separation or differentiation, an in individuation process. You want to detach yourself from the parental figure in this uh, instance, right? I mean, he is like the father. Mm. Is it freeing now to be ahead of the, the book? Um, or is, is, is that another uh, anxiety so, area? It's freeing and terrifying at the, in equal measure. That's nerve wracking, but but also yeah, also liberating. I mean, there was there was uh, it was fun. I think it was the we'll most fun it season all up to write. In the end. It's the all knowing father. Probably, I'm guessing he was more often than not a little bit like annoying in like in the ownership that he felt about. Like, okay, let me tell you, this is the way that it should be. Yeah, I assume. And then at one point, you think I can do it better than dad, right? I mean, I can do it. Uh, you know, okay, so he left me this legacy. He, uh, I inherited this company, right. <laughs> but now I can do uh, whatever I want with it yeah. because it's mine. And I'm getting an Emmy for it. And I'm getting an Emmy. And this is also something that we spoke about uh, regarding uh, Tyrion's uh, dialogue with John in the last uh, episode, when he tried explaining, you know, Daenerys's uh, the fact that she became mad. <laughs> okay. was also uh, partly to blame, you know, the, the people that uh, supported her. And ah. every time she won something, they praised her, and that made her feel more and more confident until, uh, you know, it got out of hand. The Emmy for Outstanding Drama Series goes to no, no. Game of Thrones. And we cheer her for it. And she grows more powerful and more sure that she is good and right. And you think that they were talking about themselves uh, unconsciously? Unconsciously, maybe, yeah. There was also this scene, we, we watched this scene with Littlefinger, the right. sex position scene. To play with it, why shouldn't you? He knows he's better than other men. He's always known it deep down inside. Now he has proof. He's so good. He's reaching something deep inside of you that no one even knew was there. This is also a little bit as if you're talking about yourself unconsciously. Like, yes, you are the geniuses that you, the, that you think you are. But we're not talking about them personally. I mean, we're talking about someone in their position, right? I mean, this is something that, you know, I mean, it could happen to anyone in that sense. Okay. They wanted to create the element of surprise. Like, they, did, they wanted to surpass the the fans the people that watch the show they didn't want it to be what they expected it to be at one point i guess it became dan and dave against the world because uh i mean thinking about being in their position you have him right you know yeah. which is hard to measure up to yeah. and uh, he's saying th things and you know he said in one of the interviews that sometimes they accept what he says sometimes they don't yeah. which is legitimate so you communicate with all these people either uh, symbolically or concretely and it's like uh, a whole lot of pressure you know from all directions 
A scene during Sunday's episode of Game of Thrones has reignited the controversy over the show's depiction of rape and sexual violence, drawing criticism from various media outlets as well as a United States senator. And when a person is under that kind of pressure, when everyone from all kinds of directions, from, you know, from above and from, you yeah. know, uh, I mean, what can you do? I mean, it can get too much. We've invested so much of ourselves and so much hope in this. And it was that feeling like if you mess this up, you, it's all going to go away. You have to encapsulate yourself in a way to isolate yourself from all these voices in order to create something because, that, right. you know, otherwise you could be completely castrated. Right. right. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, when it goes too far, when you don't listen to anyone else, that's also not healthy right. in the creative process. Like the actors, some of them said, we talked to them about our characters and they were like, okay, yeah, yeah, just say yeah, your yeah, lines. Yeah. They and wouldn't listen. Have... In out of season six, when Jamie comes back and sees Cersei crowning herself and finds out that, you know, Tommen is dead, that all the children are gone, in my mind, he would have to act right. immediately. They said, okay, no. We understand you want that, but we're going to wait. We're going to extend the, the, this whole thing through through the whole season. So at the very end of the season, that's when he leaves. And I got into all these arguments and fights with the writers. And they're like, yeah, we hear you. Yeah, but please, you have to blah, 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 blah. And they go, yeah, we hear you. And we respect you, but we don't care. Okay? We don't. Fuck. You're an actor. Just say the words. They didn't say it like that, but that was kind of... <laughs> that was the that gist, was the gist of, it. of it. So, I mean, that is like the unadaptive uh, part of the defense mechanism. I mean, mm -hmm. you want to be able to filter things. You want to be right. able to have your own spine, like to have, you know, you know, a spinal cord and, you know, just to feel like you can uh, uh, be confident, but also... Open. Open, exactly. I mean, open and receiving and also filtering. I mean, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. But... The, the way they watched the final episode was symbolic to the whole process that they went through. Where will you, go, will you be together? Oh, we're not. We are going to take our wives uh, to an undisclosed location together, and we're, we are uh, just going to turn our phones off, turn yeah, our computers going offline, off, and, drinking uh, a lot of tequila. Yeah, drinking tequila and, and coming back when it's over. We're going to be isolated, just like the two of us and the wives, and we're not going to be uh, reciprocal to any kind of criticism coming from the outside. Right. We're going to go into hiding. We're going into hiding. I mean, the bunker thing. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you can get like into an emotional bunker, you know, when you're completely isolated from the rest and you have these kinds of like walls or like, uh, you know, a very uh, thick uh, barrier between you and the others. And, uh, and maybe that was part of the problem. They just couldn't take the pressure of it. So basically, if we go through their arc throughout uh, the show, so they start out couple of novices mm -hmm. who have a daunting task not only to adapt this incredible story, but also they are the executive producers. They had no experience in no that. No experience. This is a huge enterprise with all these locations and actors and extras and all kinds of stuff that they don't know about. Mm -hmm. But they have this incredible material to lean on, which makes it easier. And then everybody loves this story, but not so much loves them as much as people love him. Mm -hmm. And it's, I find it interesting that they became more well known than other show creators like David Simon of The Wire or uh, Chase of uh, The Sopranos mm -hmm. and Vince Gilligan of uh, Breaking Bad, even though it's not their story. And then when they had to take the helm and start writing, and then they started to get criticism, mm -hmm. and they were very defensive about this criticism in a way that I thought was unhealthy and not a good sign. If people don't like it. Yeah. Uh, I, what am I going to say? I, I, yeah. no, no real interest in defending it. You know, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it is what it is. People, people... It's one of the, it, it is one of those things that for every person who criticizes something vocally, there, for all you know, there are 10 people who really enjoyed it. And slowly but surely, as they were getting more control and ownership of the story, which they said that they wanted, mm -hmm. they became more closed from the world, getting praise from their peers, 
but the quality of their work started deteriorating. And when you, the quality of your work started deteriorating, but everybody's around you, or your, uh, your peers telling you, wow, incredible job, incredible job. Mm -hmm. This seems like the perfect recipe for a season that is totally disconnected from the core of the work of the story. Like they were like, we're not gonna focus on writing the story, which is, this is the basis of Game of Thrones. We're gonna focus on the spectacle. Dracarys. We thought it was important that whatever the plan was, that it would not just work out, because that would be kind of dull. While there's no reason to know for certain that the fire wouldn't kill or destroy the Night King, there's also no particular reason to believe that it would. This, it seems like a natural process. You can make a movie about, about these two guys. Mm -hmm. Irreconcilable gaps, right? I mean, okay. and what do you uh, mean? like between uh, the quality of the show and the praise that they were receiving. Definitely. And but we can also see like that the way they spoke about the show, their emotional engagement in the first seasons as compared to the last Whoa. season, was completely different. Wow, they were so engaged. They were so in the engaged. Beginning. I mean, they were so you could really see that they were going through an emotional process with the characters, which changed. She's never known her father, she's never known her family, she's never known her homeland. The only thing she's ever known has been her brother. She's been raised by her brother. And, and then, this season? Yeah, nothing. And uh, I mean, we just, you know, we saw some of the, like, the angry or disgusted faces that they made, but I mean, it wasn't... Yeah. Uh, it was like, like a chore. It was like a chore, the, yeah, exactly. And their explanation, and, and the insight that they brought in the, the inside the episodes in the first seasons, mm -hmm. it was just like, oh, so you're not stupid, the two stupid people who know nothing about nothing. Mm -hmm. it's, I don't know, was it, how come you get the project of a lifetime mm -hmm. and you become lazy about it? Mm -hmm. So how? I think that they were, I mean, I'm not sure, of course, it, but we can also see, I mean, I said, I think, and this is also what they said a lot, like in the last seasons, right? I think Danny did this because mm -hmm. of that. I think she did. So in the first seasons, they don't say, I think, all that much yeah. because they know because he gave the motivations for the characters wow. and uh, and they had this kind of like feeling of being backed up by his ideas and in the last season we see that they they lose their confidence in a way yeah the zombie giant thing in the first seasons they did say whites right they like didn't uh, zombies. they didn't say zombies so so this like there was this kind of like a uh, uh, disengagement process that they went through for some reason. I think it was the too muchness of uh, pressure or whatever, you know? Yeah, feeling maybe, maybe they weren't up for the job. Yeah. But maybe their talent is more adapting uh, great material, which is fine. You don't have to have, not everybody, not everybody has to have the exact same talent. One actor can be great in this, one actor can be great in that, one writer can be great in adapting. Right a story that everybody loves, and another person can be great at, uh, write, at creating this. Right. But maybe they felt like if it's not theirs, then it doesn't mean enough. Mm -hmm. And also, it seems like they became greedy in the sense that they wanted to cash in and move on to the next project, but still keep ownership, not let anybody else Mm -hmm. do the job. Yeah, that was also a mistake because, I mean, it wasn't their choice completely to do it by themselves. I mean, they said that they had counted on uh, him finishing the books before the, you right. know. So, I mean, it wasn't completely their choice, but it was their choice not to turn to other people uh, once they, uh, you know, realized that this is what was going on. And and I do think that uh, going doing Star Wars like, I think it's a mistake because this is like part of the repetition compulsion thing, right? They don't have a basis to build on. They're just going to take this format, which is completely, I mean, it's the same kind of what Game of Thrones became. You have the fans that are angry just fans. angry fans that are just, you know, if you don't give them exactly what they want. I mean, it's again, this process of like being forced to please people and then uh, being resenting angry, it. resenting it. And uh, just, uh, you know, just saying, oh, we can't please anyone, so we might as well not try to please anything, you know, just, you know. Yeah, we'll try to not please anyone. We don't yeah. want anybody, anybody to be pleased. Exactly. Each character, we're going to take a different direction. Like, 
which conclusion is anybody pleased uh, of? Yeah. Daenerys, no. John, no. Bran, no. Sansa, yeah. no. Arya, no. Yeah. Just like where is the sweet in this ending? Like we even the sweet that... is bitter. Yeah. I don't know. Sam is sweet, but whatever. But it's still, it's not uh, satisfying. Like it's as if yeah. they and wanted to shove it in our faces in some way. Like it's, it, it became hostile. It doesn't matter what we think our reasons are. There's a greater purpose at work, and we serve it together, whether we know it or not. We may take the steps, but the Lord of Light. For fuck's the... sake, will you shut your hole? Obviously, the internet is hostile. We know yeah, that, very like, in, hostile, like in yeah. very minute, uh, whatever, very small uh, in, uh, examples compared to them. Yeah, even we love you people. We love you people. Yeah. But when when you are hostile and when you are writing uh, malicious comments, still within the maliciousness, you can sometimes, if you want to, find something that you can use. Mm -hmm. If you take the maliciousness and then you shut yourself out, off of all suggestions, criticisms, then your creation, your creative work will suffer. Yeah, definitely. And, and it's, it's kind of metastasized more and more and more, culminating in the way Daenerys burned the city and said, they're like, fuck it, burn it all. Mm -hmm. It's as if they were like... Just burn it all, yeah. Burn it all. Yeah. I'm gonna burn the story, I'm not gonna leave anything left for anybody we're gonna burn the all the viewers mm -hmm. not gonna burn him over there in the red keep we're gonna burn everybody and i must say as much as i'm angry to, uh, at them i'm angry with them angry with them i feel sorry for them mm -hmm. me too because now they're humiliated yeah how can they go to the next job and not have like their reputation has been destroyed destroyed i the imdb rating of the final episode is 4.3 this is a disgrace disgrace they're they're disgraced no matter how you spin it they're disgraced i must say that all this sounds extremely unhealthy to me like a self-destructive mechanism as if they're sabotaging their own work and their own careers i feel sorry for them as well anything else we've got this? and i feel sorry for us yes 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 we have to let's wrap it up but we're also saying like maybe them being detached is like uh, de like denying their dependency on the show right we don't need the, the, the story right. this story can do another thing go do star wars we're fine we're professionals right this mm -hmm. is just a job okay everybody so let us know what you think about D &D in the comments please be polite please be respectful Please be nice. Why are you nodding your head no when you say all these things? I think nodding your head no <laughs> is... <laughs> Lala, so why are you shaking your head no? Um, I, I want to send them mixed uh, messages. Okay, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say that out loud? <laughs> Let's see what comes out of this. And I want to thank our patrons for always being nice and respectful. Yeah, and supporting we have our great, work. We have great, great patrons. patrons and people viewing in our channel. Thank you so much. So thank you everybody for watching. We'll see you all next time. Bye, Bye. everybody. So if you've been enjoying Goth Academy videos for a long time, you're gonna love the Goth Academy podcast. Yes, we have a podcast now. You can check it out on iTunes, on Spotify, on Stitcher, the Goth Academy podcast. Because it's in podcast form, the conversations can be longer, we can go deeper. We have new collaborators, it's all super, super exciting, so we're not just a YouTube channel anymore. Now, we do content, check it out, Got Academy Podcast.